Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another members webinar. Now today we're going to be talking about quite a tricky topic. We're going to be talking about sizing the turbocharger or the correct turbocharger for your engine. And this is a difficult topic because there are simply so many options out there in the turbo aftermarket world these days that it can be quite daunting to decide on exactly what turbo is going to fit your aims. Particularly when we're also talking about a turbocharger being what is quite an expensive addition to your engine, you don't want to be going wasting money on a turbocharger that once you get it on the engine doesn't prove to do what you want it to. As usual with this webinar we will be having questions and answers at the end. There's a lot to cover here uh, so if there's anything that I talk about that you'd like me to delve into in more detail please ask those questions in the comments and the guys will transfer those through to me. Now part of the reason that turbo sizing is quite tricky is that there are so many variables that can affect the way a turbocharger is going to perform on any given engine. So I'd like to say here that turbo sizing is definitely a science but I sort of would also say it's a slight combination between a science and an art. Uh, so we'll find out some techniques though as we go through this that will take some of the confusion away and give you the best possible chance of getting the correct outcome for your application the very first time around. Uh, if you get it wrong, obviously there's two downsides here. Uh, the first is if you go with a turbocharger that is too large for your application, you're likely to get into a situation where you've got absolutely no uh, low RPM performance. Uh, it takes a certain amount of exhaust gas energy to actually get the turbocharger moving and producing airflow which results in our boost pressure and if we don't have enough exhaust gas energy to drive the turbo at low RPM we're going to end up with no low RPM boost. So this is particularly important, a particularly important consideration for those of you who are uh, sizing a turbocharger for a street application, uh, also those of you who are sizing a turbocharger for uh, circuit racing. Here we really need to trade off that often outright power is not the most important thing and partic particularly for a street application uh, it's actually going to be probably pretty frustrating and often quite slow driving around in a car that doesn't produce any real performance below about five and a half or six thousand rpm. Uh, fortunately as well we have seen some massive advances in turbo technology over the last decade and we're really fortunate these days to have access to some really advanced turbochargers uh, from the likes of Borg Warner we've got a, an EF uh, 8474 sitting in front of me. Uh, also Garrett are coming a long way with their GTX turbochargers and their new G series turbochargers which we're going to be talking about in a little bit more detail as well. Uh, we've seen advances in the aerodynamics in the wheel designs, uh, some advances in the materials as well that have all added up to give us turbocharger performance that we simply couldn't have dreamed of uh, probably no more than about five to eight years ago. All right, I was talking about the downsides of getting your turbo wrong. Of course, we've just talked there about what happens if your turbocharger is too big. Uh, the flip side of that coin, though, of course, is if you've got a turbocharger that's too small, you're going to get great punch off the line. It's going to build boost exceptionally well at low RPM, uh, but you're also going to end up with that turbocharger essentially choking airflow through the engine at high RPM. It's not going to be able to flow the sort of air that we're going to need in order to make really high power levels. So. Uh, it really is a case of deciding on what compromise you want to make and whereabouts in the power band you're expecting to make your power. Now I'm going to start here by talking about a term that I think uh, when it comes to turbo performance in general is largely misunderstood and that is boost pressure. I know that a lot of enthusiasts really think that boost pressure is one of the key metrics when it comes to turbo performance and in my opinion it is largely irrelevant. Now that might sound strange, obviously we need to know how much boost our engine is running but there is a lot more to it than boost pressure uh, if we want to know how much power our engine is likely to make. So that's why I say it's largely irrelevant. So what I'll, what I'll use for an example here is if we were running 15 psi of boost on let's say a 2 litre Mitsubishi 4G63 engine using a Garrett GT3076 turbocharger and then we took that 3076, we threw it in the bin and 
and we fitted uh, a Garrett GT42. Just for a quick example there, the GT42, a much bigger turbocharger, much bigger compressor and exhaust housing. Particularly there, the exhaust side of the turbocharger is going to pose a lot less restriction to airflow through the engine. So what I'm getting at here, hopefully most of you watching could probably understand that 15 psi of boost pressure on the 3076 is going to give us a vastly different amount of power from our, this, exactly the same engine compared to what we would get if we swapped to that Garrett GT4202. So the way I like to try and explain boost pressure in a way that's simple to understand is the boost pressure is really a way of thinking about the amount of restriction that the engine itself poses to airflow. So in other words, all things being equal, as we uh, open the airflow through the engine up, we allow the engine to breathe more easily. For the same boost pressure we're actually going to be moving more air. So another way of looking at that or another uh, sort of way we can break that down is that if we have exactly the same turbocharger on our stock engine and then we take our engine apart and we do all of the sort of work that we do to our engines when we're modifying them. I'm talking here about freer flowing intake systems. I'm talking about larger inlet manifolds perhaps that flow better. Uh, maybe we're porting the cylinder head and adding a set of cams, a free flowing exhaust all of that work allows the engine to breathe more easily. In other words, it increases the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So now when we fit our, uh, the exact same turbo back on that engine and we run the same amount of boost pressure, we're going to end up with our engine making more power and hopefully that's something everyone can relate to. So while yes, we do need to know and have an idea of how much boost pressure we're running or what, we, what boost pressure we want to run, you cannot make a direct correlation between boost pressure and power, there's a lot more in it than that. Uh, it's also really important there uh, to understand that relationship uh, when we're looking at trying to make a lot of power uh, from a turbocharged engine in a small capacity application. So this is sort of my background was import drag racing where we're using two litre four cylinder engines. We're trying to make 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 horsepower out of these engines. Now in order to move the amount of air through through such a small capacity engine, the way we need to do this is by running very, very high boost pressures. Conversely, and this is really to overcome the restriction that the engine poses to that airflow. Conversely, if we wanted to make that same amount of power out of, a, let's say, a 6 litre GM LS2 V8, we've got a lot more capacity there, the engine can physically flow more air, so we're not going to need anything like that sort of boost pressure in order to uh, make the same power that we're trying to get out of our small capacity engine. Right, the other, the, the next topic that I want to talk about, sort of another uh, breaking down a few myths and misconceptions here, we're going to talk about the term lag and this is so often misused. So really there are two terms that uh, unfortunately out there in the wider industry tend to be mixed up and used incorrectly. Uh, I use the term lag and I use the term boost threshold and they are not the same. So boost threshold refers to whereabouts in the engine's rev range we can achieve our full boost. So let's say for example we're trying to make 15 psi of boost. Uh, we may, depending on the size of our engine and the size of our turbocharger, we not, may not be able to get to that boost set point until let's say perhaps 3000 RPM. Uh, so that is our boost threshold. What I'm actually going to do is just give you a quick visual drawing of this. I apologise for my crappy sketching skills but let's head across to my laptop screen. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll draw a vertical line here. So this is our boost. Let's uh, just put a B on there. And then on the horizontal RPM here, we've got our RPM. Okay, so a typical boost curve might look something perhaps like this. And this is the point here where we've reached full boost. This is our boost threshold and let's say as I've said that that might be 3000 RPM. Okay so that's one aspect and this is the term that most people confuse or use incorrectly for lag. 
Once we're above that boost threshold though, if we back off the throttle, so let's say for example now we're at 4500 RPM, uh, we're at full throttle, we've achieved full boost, we back off the throttle, we completely close the throttle, maybe we're coming up to a corner, we're still at 4500 RPM, so we're still above that minimum boost threshold, but when we put our foot back on the throttle, we go straight back to full throttle, the turbo can't instant, instantly jump back to that 15 psi. Granted, they've got a lot better over the last decade, but they still can't instantly get back to uh, that 15 psi. Uh, so if we were to look at what happens uh, when when we go back to full throttle, let's just look at this time. Oh, let's try again. Told you I wasn't very good at drawing. Right, we'll. We'll still use boost there on our vertical axis and this time we're going to have time on our horizontal axis. So we're above our boost threshold and what we find is that when we jump back on the throttle we end up with our boost doing something like this. So there might be somewhere in the region of uh, half a, maybe a tenth of a second or thereabouts in time lag uh, before the turbo reaches full boost again. Uh, so this is the term that we're confusing with lag. So just Im important to understand the differentiation between boost threshold and lag. So the boost threshold itself, the reason we have that is because we need a certain amount of compressor or turbine wheel speed in order to achieve the, uh, the airflow that we need in order to reach our boost target. Uh, so this really comes down to providing the turbocharger with enough energy from our exhaust gas. And of course we don't have much exhaust flow at very low RPM. As the engine RPM increases, our airflow through the engine increases, we start supplying more and more exhaust gas energy to the turbocharger which drives it harder and harder hence that's why we can make our boost pressure. Uh, on the other hand our lag really comes down to the fact that the rotating assembly inside our turbocharger, uh, the compressor wheel and more importantly the exhaust wheel, they are relatively heavy and they have a certain amount of inertia to them so again we can't instantly jump back to getting our full boost set point. And as I've said these, uh, there's been some pretty big advantages advances in the turbo technology that have really helped reduce uh, in particular, well actually both the boost threshold as well as the lag which we're going to talk about shortly. Alright so let's get into that actually right now which is what affects the turbocharger's performance. So obviously the size of the wheels themselves to flow a specific amount of air we're going to need a certain size wheel obviously as we want to move more and more air we tend to see the compressor wheel get bigger and bigger and we also as a, a result need to flow more exhaust gas out the other side of the engine so our exhaust wheels get bigger and bigger. Uh, it's hard to draw a strict correlation between the size of the compressor and turbine wheels with how much power the turbocharger is capable of supporting, particularly these days as we've seen advances in aerodynamics and materials used in turbochargers, uh, the size of the turbochargers and the amount of power they've, they're able to support just would not have been believed just a few short years ago. Uh, so that first topic that I want to talk about here in terms of the aspects that affect our turbo performance is the aerodynamics and this is where we've seen huge advances both from Garrett, uh, from uh, Borg Warner as well as the vast majority of other uh, name brand players out there in the market, Precision for example uh, and I'm not trying to to uh, pick just a couple of brands here, it's just the reason I've mentioned Garrett and Borg Warner is we're going to have a look at their online calculators really shortly. Uh, so this has come in a number of ways, we've seen obviously a, a lot of advances in the ability to perform computational fluid dynamics, this is seen in general aerodynamics, it's being applied to turbocharger technology as well. And the reason this is important to the turbo manufacturers is it means that a lot of their development can be done uh, without ever having to make a physical product like this so they can uh, make design changes to the compressor wheel and run it through tests in their CFD software and they're going to have a really good idea uh, if the direction they're moving in is an advantage or a disadvantage. So instead of trying 50 different compressor wheels for example, generally uh, manufacturing those and then physically testing them in a real life environment, uh, what they can do instead is really narrow down to 
to maybe five designs that they think are going to work well based on the CFD testing, produce those and it just improves or speeds up the, the prototyping process. So that's important to understand. Now the other topic I'll talk about here is billet compressor wheels versus cast. And again, I think this has become a bit of a hot topic out there in the turbo industry. Uh, and it, it is something that a lot of turbo manufacturers are using as a sales point. Billet wheels look great, they're nice and shiny. Uh, but it's important to understand why turbo manufacturers are using billet wheels. And also important to understand that just because your turbocharger has a billet wheel, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's going to provide better performance. Now let me kind of get back to, to, to why that is the case. Uh, so first of all, one of the key reasons why billet wheels have become so uh, prominent these days is that it is much easier to produce short runs of turbochargers using uh, CNC machining of a piece of billet rather than actually casting the wheels. It's a much faster process. That being said, it doesn't really lend itself well to large scale production volumes. So in the OE world, we're probably unlikely to see uh, billet wheels becoming mainstream. The sort of production numbers that are required at the OE production vehicle level uh, is simply so great that cast wheels just simply make a lot more sense. But for performance turbocharger applications, and it's also worth mentioning here, uh, for us in the performance world, it's easy to forget that or think that the performance world is uh, all powerful and all encompassing but the reality is that the uh, performance brands from the likes of Garrett, the likes of Borg Warner etc uh, actually are only a tiny percentage of their overall turbo production. Uh, the number of turbos they're producing for a performance application might be only a few percent compared to their overall OE production. So uh, that's one thing to, to consider there. Uh, the importance of their performance turbocharger line compared to their OE line and those numbers. So uh, anything they can do to speed up the production and the prototyping is valuable and that's where those CNC billet wheels come in. Uh, it allows them to test multiple designs and validate them in real world conditions much faster than if they were to produce cast wheels. Now there are some genuine advantages to uh, billet wheels as well. Uh, they are gener generally able to be stronger, produced to be stronger than a cast wheel and this is really important for those guys pushing turbochargers to the limits uh, and particularly in drag applications where we're seeing people uh, running 100 plus psi of boost pressure and compressor wheel speeds that, that really are at the absolute limit of the reliability. The, the cast wheel uh, sorry, the billet wheel is simply stronger at that, that kind of level. Uh, the other reason that we can see a small improvement in uh, performance from a billet wheel compared to a cast wheel is because of that strength, it's possible to machine the hub uh, where the, the compressor wheel bolts onto the shaft a, a little bit narrower, a little bit thinner, so we're actually flowing a little bit more air or have the potential to flow a little bit more air for the same compressor wheel diameters. Now, what I've kind of overlooked here, which I should have right at the start is uh, basically the billet wheel, if we take a billet wheel and we can manufacture a cast wheel uh, for all intents and purposes with exactly the same profile, the same aerodynamics, uh, notwithstanding what I've just mentioned about the hub and uh, all things being equal, just making the compressor wheel out of a billet material and CNC machining it does not in and of itself mean that that wheel is going to make more power or flow more air. It's all of those other reasons that I've mentioned there. So uh, don't just get sucked in there and think that uh, billet wheels are uh, an absolute must have. Just understand where they sit in the big scheme of things and why manufacturers are now turning to them. Now the other advances we've seen here which have really improved our turbocharger performance is in the materials being used particularly in the turbine wheel. Now I said that one of the factors that affects both our boost threshold as well as our lag is the mass of the turbocharger's rotating assembly. Uh, we need to overcome the inertia of that rotating assembly in order to get it up to speed and produce boost pressure. So anything we can do to reduce the mass of the components is going to help there. Uh, we saw some drives towards this back in probably the earlier days of turbocharging now. Uh, Nissan were one of the manufacturers, one of the OE manufacturers that turned, turned to ceramic turbine wheels. Uh, for our purposes in the aftermarket that was an ill-fated move because anyone who 
has tuned uh, Nissan vehicles running the ceramic turbos will know that they are prone to falling off if you run too much boost. This, this is because the ceramic material was essentially bonded to uh, the steel shaft of the turbocharger. Uh, also not very forgiving if something goes through it, you're more likely to end up with the blades on the turbine wheel breaking. Uh, these days we've seen advances and some of the common materials up until recently were uh, the likes of Inconel, very well suited to high temperature operation. Uh, these days the two materials that I'm going to talk about is uh, in the Borg Warner range, the EFR range, uh, they've moved to what they've referred to as Gamma Tai. Uh, in the new Garrett G series they've moved to uh, their own proprietary material called Mar M. Uh, I'm not a metallurgist, I'm not going to jump in and start trying to explain to you what those materials are actually made of, but in layman's terms what we need to understand is that they are a uh, lighter material. So the turbocharger can be manufactured and uh, still uh, manufactured out of this material and be lighter. The rotating assembly is lighter, giving us all those advantages we have talked about. Some of these materials, another uh, advantage with them is that they can support uh, higher operating temperatures. Uh, for example, with Garrett's G-Series turbos using the Ma M material, uh, these are now rated to continuous use at 1050 degrees centigrade. So uh, that's getting up there, but of course, as we see, more and more people push turbos harder, uh, we do need materials that will support that sort of uh, operating temperature. Uh, the last aspect I'll just talk about here is uh, twin scroll versus single scroll turbine housings. I'm hoping that anyone who's sort of done any kind of research into turbochargers will probably have already heard of those terms and maybe have a, a, a rough understanding of how that works. Uh, but this particular 8474 here does use a split pulse exhaust housing. So basically it has twin scrolls that, uh, that go to the turbine wheel. And what we want to do when we're manufacturing a turbo manifold for a split pulse exhaust housing is we want to take advantage of that with the uh, firing order of our engine and it's about trying to deliver the pulses to the, the exhaust pulses, exhaust gas pulses to the turbine wheel in a way where uh, we can get most advantage from those uh, acting on the turbine wheel. So in general it, it's, it's actually also I should say quite difficult to get a uh, back to back comparison where the only thing that has been changed is an open scroll to a split scroll housing uh, but uh, but generally what you're going to find is that if you do that, you're going to end up with better low RPM boost response or alternatively what you can do is jump up to a larger exhaust housing, a freer flowing exhaust housing with a larger AR. That's still going to give you the same low end boost response but alternatively what it's going to do is give you less turbine inlet pressure. Don't worry about these terms, we're going to talk about them in detail really shortly. So you're going to end up with an engine that can produce more power without sacrificing bottom end performance. Alright, so with some of those basics out of the way, remember if there are any questions about anything that I'm talking about, just ask them in the comments and I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, we had to kind of get that background bit out of the way before we can jump into the actual topic here which is turbo sizing. And what we want to talk about for a start is the options available to us when it comes to choosing a turbo. One of the options, which is probably the easiest because you're essentially handing over responsibility to someone else, is to rely on a performance workshop that is familiar with your car. Now, that's not really going to be the main focus here of our webinar, clearly. That's not exactly particularly scientific. Uh, but it isn't a bad option if you live in a part of the world where you've got some great specialists who know your particular model of car inside and out. And um, what I'll do there is give just a couple of examples there. The likes of AMS Performance in the US, they are very well versed with the R35 GTR platform. They've done a lot of development uh, and they know what sort of turbochargers will provide what sort of power range and when you're talking to a shop at that kind of level you can basically state to them your power range and what you want to do with the vehicle they're going to be able to tell you very very accurately what turbo setup is going to suit your particular vehicle they've done it all before they've got the data they're probably going to be able to even give you dyno plots to, to show you exactly what you expect to get 
Uh, now, I've used AMS Performance as an example there. Obviously, there are workshops around the world that specialise in all sorts of different vehicles. Uh, so if you're dealing with something popular, uh, maybe the Mitsubishi Evo range, maybe the Subaru WRX STI range, all of these sorts of turbo setups have been tested and tried to death and spe uh, workshops that specialise in those vehicles will have a really good uh, database of what does what and will be able to help guide you in the right direction. Now from there you can also choose to do your own research on the internet. Now the internet is a scary place and this can end up wasting hours if not days. It can also send you on a wild goose chase. So you do need to sort of temper this a little bit with what you're expecting to achieve. Uh, you need to understand that you're going to see a lot of conflicting information. So if you want to go down this path it is really important to be able to sort of uh, sense f fact from fiction and what you're looking for here is a lot of results that sort of back up the same sort of numbers so that you can be confident. Now this is only going to work if you are dealing with a fairly common platform. So I've talked there about R35 GTR, I've talked about um, Mitsubishi Evo and also Subaru. It gets a little harder when you are dealing with something a little bit out of left field that isn't popular for modification. So we'll deal with how to look at that in the next section. But for a couple of examples there of how this can work, let's just jump across to my laptop screen for a moment. Uh, so this is the Full Race website and this isn't a sales pitch for Full Race. We, um, don't, we don't make a cent of anyone buys a turbocharger from full race so I just want to be really clear about that but uh, this is for the Borg Warner EFR 8374 the reason I've gone to this particular website is because they do a reasonably good job of trying to give you a bit of information around this turbocharger uh, so the first thing if we come down here a little bit you're going to see under description let's try that for a start you're going to see exactly what the turbocharger is capable of doing. So uh, basically it says that it is going to be able to flow somewhere in the region of five to 800 horsepower in a single application or up to 1300 horsepower twin turbo. Okay, great, that's some information that's helpful, but where it does get useful is if we jump across to their results tab, uh, we'll go through these videos, which we're not that interested in. and we get down to, they have a range of dyno plots for a variety of different uh, vehicles running the 8374. Now it's useful to a point, particularly if you do happen to have one of these vehicles uh, that is in this list, then great, you can kind of see uh, exactly what you can expect from that particular turbo and that particular application. Problems with that are that uh, you don't necessarily know every single modification that has been made to that vehicle to help support the turbocharger. And then of course as we've just seen there's a variety of different dyno plots available and we all probably hopefully know by this point that not all dynos are created equal so that does add a little bit of confusion. Now the other option again with a common platform is we can also have a look at enthusiast forums. So again on my laptop screen here uh, let's say we wanted to see what the performance of a uh, Precision 6266 turbocharger is going to be on a stock block Evo 8. Basically you can put that search criteria into a popular uh, enthusiast forum, in this case I'm on the Evo M uh, forum, and you're going to be able to often get exact results as to what other people have achieved on that. So it's not a bad way of going to get a bit of a feel for what sort of turbocharger options are out there. Uh, what sort of turbochargers people are using to get the power levels that you're aiming for and then if you've got a particular turbocharger in mind it's a good idea to, to get a feel for where you're going to see full boost, how usable the bottom end performance is going to be, those sorts of things. Alright so now what we're going to do is get into the more advanced side of turbo sizing and this is where we can start using a specific turbo sizing tools. Uh, the two that I'm going to cover here there's one called the Boost Advisor which is Garrett's one. Uh, this is relatively simplistic uh, but it is going to be helpful for getting you a reasonable guide as to which turbos in the Garrett lineup uh, might suit your application and then we'll have a look at Borg Warner's Matchbot which is much more sophisticated and requires a lot more input from the user. Uh, before we do that though it is important here to uh, 
understand some of the basics around reading a compressor map. Uh, we do need to sort of know what we're actually looking at on a compressor map and what all the numbers mean. Uh, so let's just have a quick look at a compressor map. We'll jump across to my laptop screen again for a moment. And this is what you're likely to see from most of the manufacturers that produce compressor maps. And we've got two axes here. On our vertical axis is our pressure ratio. So this is simply the pressure coming out of the turbocharger, so the compressor outlet, outlet pressure, divided by your compressor inlet pressure. So basically it's the pressure working across the turbocharger's compressor wheel. So most instances we're going to assume that the compressor inlet pressure is barometric air pressure. The reality is it's often going to be a little bit worse than this because we can see a restriction uh, before the compressor inlet based on the restriction of our air filter, maybe the inlet plumbing up to the turbocharger. So we may end up being a little bit lower than that. But to give you some really rough numbers here, if we were running 200 kPa of boost pressure and we had 100 kPa of atmospheric pressure, uh, then we would be running at a pressure ratio of 2. So we're going to be uh, running across this area in our compressor map here. Uh, the horizontal axis that we've got here is our corrected airflow in pounds per minute. So this just gives us some kind of indication of uh, how much air the turbocharger is able to move. It's a really key consideration when we are choosing a compressor capable of supporting a certain power level. Uh, if we can't flow enough air then we're not going to be able to make that power. It's that simple. Then inside of the compressor map itself we have all of our uh, efficiency islands here. There are a couple of points that are worth mentioning on our compressor map. First of all, the line on the left hand side of our compressor map is a quite an important one. This is called the surge line or surge limit and when we are plotting points on this compressor map, which we're going to get into really shortly, uh, it's important to make sure that we aren't operating on the left hand side of this uh, surge line. We don't want to be out here. Uh, if we run the compressor into surge, uh, it becomes very violent. Uh, it's going to be quite damaging to the turbocharger components itself uh, and it's not going to be a pleasant experience driving a car that is surging. Likewise on the right hand side here we've got our choke limit or choke line and basically this is the uh, point where the efficiency of the turbocharger just drops off a cliff and instead of moving air it's just pumping more and more heat into the compressor outlet air. So ideally what we want to be doing understandably is running somewhere in the middle of this com compressor map and the islands inside this compressor map show how efficient the compressor is at this point. Uh, so for example the peak island here we can see that the compressor is 76% efficient. Now in layman's terms what that means is that when we compress air physics dictates that we will add heat to the air. We can't get around that. We're always going to be heating up the air which is why we need an intercooler. However, the worse the efficiency of the compressor wheel is, uh, the more heat it's going to be adding into that air. So the intercooler is going to have to work extra hard and also the more uh, energy the turbocharger is going to require or the compressor is going to require in order to uh, move that amount of air. The last topic or last point uh, on the compressor map as well is we've got these lines running down like this and these are the turbine speed lines. You can actually see uh, the numbers on the right hand side for the, the turbo speed. Uh, so these show us how fast the turbocharger is, is operating these days as well as we'll talk about at the end of the lesson. Uh, we have the ability to actually validate some of these numbers ourselves. So important just to have a basic understanding of our compressor map. Uh, there is also a rough rule of thumb here that uh, when we are looking at airflow numbers, uh, we need approximately 9.5 to 10.5 pounds of airflow per minute for every 100 horsepower we want to make. 
Uh, so for example, if we just jump back across here to our BorgWarner 8374 page, I'll just get back to our description here. Uh, we can see that the airflow capability, the max airflow here uh, on that is 79 pounds per minute. Uh, so in rough terms, this means that the turbocharger is going to be capable of flowing somewhere in the region of about 800 or 790 horsepower, let's call it 800 for round numbers. So uh, that's one of the key numbers that we do need to keep in mind. Mind. Uh, it isn't 100% reliable though, we can't guarantee that just because we have a turbocharger capable of flowing uh, 79 pounds of air per minute that that's what we're going to make 800 horsepower. Uh, the turbo flow will to get that flow we need to be operating in the correct pressure ratio and there's also other aspects to do with our engine design that can affect uh, the the ability to make the sort of power the turbo is capable of. So for example what I mean here is if we're oper operating on a low grade of pump gas, a low octane pump gas then we're almost certainly going to be what I will refer to as knock limited and this is the point where we start increasing the boost pressure and advancing the ignition timing we get to the onset of detonation. Clearly we can't operate our engine with sustained knock or detonation occurring so we need to retard the timing or reduce the boost pressure in order to prevent that. Uh, so this can artificially limit uh, the sort of power that we can get out of uh, even a, a 800 horsepower rated turbocharger. Uh, the other aspect there as well is it also re uh, depends on your engine's ability to actually move air through it. So uh, if you've got a very restrictive engine that uh, maybe has a very small camshaft, maybe a very small exhaust system or restrictive intake, uh, that is also going to uh, be a limitation. Alright, so what we'll do here is we'll jump into a couple of demonstrations and I'm going to start with the easiest one. So let's head across to my laptop screen. Uh, you can find this at your leisure on the Garrett Advancing Motion website. This is their Boost Advisor. Uh, so we'll go through a quick example here. Let's click on Begin. And what we're going to do here is put in some round numbers for our Nissan SR20VE and we'll see what Garrett's website comes up with for this. So let's say for example here we are targeting 700 horsepower so we enter that, click next and we're going to go down to our next question which is what is our engine capacity. So in this case we have a 2 litre 4 cylinder engine, click on next. We're only going to install one turbocharger on this engine. Nothing's particularly difficult so far. Here we need to tell them what fuel we're going to run on. In this case, E85. So that's going to remove some of those problems around the uh, restriction, the knock limitation, I should say, of the engine. Uh, what is our intercooler type? We're running an air-to-air -air intercooler. And then we also need to tell the boost advisor how many valves are in the engine. So this is around the volumetric efficiency of the engine. Uh, now we're going to look at our engine mid-range RPM. So let's just, for example, here enter 4,000 and we'll try and make peak power here at 8,000 RPM. We'll click next and we'll say that we are at sea level. We're pretty close here in Queenstown. Uh, let's take our ambient temperature here as 20 degrees C. C. We'll click next. This particular part, not a lot of use for me, but we'll just click on show recommendations and we'll see uh, what Garrett have come up with. Uh, so first of all, we've got some, some uh, suggestions around the power the engine will make as well as the boost pressure and pressure ratio we're going to need to be operating at as well as our intake manifold temperature, corrected airflow, etc. And uh, we can see here our max power RPM. We should be able to see around 700 horsepower with about 34 psi which equates to a uh, pressure ratio of about 3.37. Our intake manifold temperature would be around 102 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't convert that to C in my head, but that doesn't really matter. And we're going to be using 56.74 pounds per minute of airflow. All right, so let's look at the turbochargers that are likely to be able to do that. And we've got here a GTX 3076, uh, which interestingly is the turbocharger that we're currently running. Uh, alternatively, we could step up to a 35. 76. All right, that's helpful to a point. It's given us two turbocharger options uh, that should suit those aims. Now, here the system from Garrett, the Boost Advisor, is quite simplistic. That's okay, they've made the choice to do this because this is a complex topic and what we're going to have to do is make a trade-off here between how many inputs we need to provide the Boost Advisor and how 
accurate and how complete our results set are going to be. And essentially, if we ask more and more information from the user, uh, it's going to be hard for a lot of mainstream users to be able to provide this information and get the results. So this isn't a bad compromise here. Both of those turbochargers are probably going to do a more than adequate job of making that sort of power level. So you're in the ballpark, you know what will work. Problem is, you're not going to have uh, an exact idea of uh, what that particular turbocharger may do on your engine. All right, so what we'll do now is we'll jump in and we're going to have a look at Borg Warner's Matchbot. So this is a lot more complex. It is uh, going to require a lot more information from us. And there's a lot more room for error. So this is going to suit the more tech heads among our followers out there. Uh, there are also, I'll mention here, I'm going to go through a simplistic uh, sort of approach to this. I'm not going to cover everything in detail. we would be here for another hour. Uh, if, if you are interested, in learning a little bit more about Matchbot, Borgwana have produced their own YouTube series of uh, videos on how to use the Matchbot. It's really great, it's really simple to understand and that should get you up to speed with uh, the system pretty easily. Alright, so what we're going to do here, this is Matchbot, you can find it by searching Matchbot uh, and Borgwana, pretty easy. Uh, to start with, we've got some information at the top here that we need to enter. Uh, so in particular, our turbo configuration, we're going with a single turbo here. What we're actually going to be doing is looking at sizing a turbocharger for a 2.6 litre Nissan R32 GTR RB26 engine. So we've got our engine capacity in litres there at 2.6 litres. It's asking for our ambient temperature which I've just put in there at 70 degrees Fahrenheit and again we're just assuming here that our altitude is zero we're at sea level so we're running under standard atmospheric conditions 14.7 psi and our fuel for this particular application is going to be pump gas Right, so now we need to enter some more information here. Uh, we've got six points that are going to be plotted on our compressor and our turb turbine maps. And we can, to start with, choose the engine RPM for these set points. Uh, I've actually left this at the default values because uh, we're looking here at something that's going to be relatively responsive and provide good boost response at low RPM. So I've left my first set point there at 2000. Uh, so we obviously span, span that out to 7,000 RPM. Uh, the next line down is our volumetric efficiency. Now this is one of the problems with these sorts of calculators is there are some uh, assumptions that need to be made here. Uh, most people, including myself, are not going to know accurately what the volumetric efficiency of your engine is. Uh, so we are going to have to take a bit of a guess here. Uh, if you click on the little question mark here, uh, there are some ideas or uh, sort of sensible starting points to use. Uh, what we've done here here is we've assumed that our modified RB26 is going to be pretty efficient and we're using numbers around about 100, 105% from sort of 4000 RPM and above, our VE a little bit lower down at low RPM. Uh, then we're looking at our boost pressure here. So we've said that uh, at 2000 RPM it would be great if we could get 5 PSI. We're expecting that it's going to ramp up and we're going to have about 15 PSI by 3000. And then we're going to hold our boost at a maximum of 18 PSI. Uh, so this should be something that's achievable uh, in an application that's going to give us a nice uh, power band. It's going to give us a decent amount of power and it's also going to be able to be nice and responsive. Uh, next up we have our intercooler efficiency, again something we're really going to be having to take a bit of a guess at here, so uh, we're just using some default values from Borg Warner. Uh, we're 96% efficient at low RPM, this is because the airflow through the intercooler is quite slow so uh, it's easier for the intercooler to remove heat from the air. Uh, that drops down a little bit, we're at 90% efficiency at 7000 RPM, some instances it may be lower than that, so obviously that's going to depend on your intercooler. Next, we're also going to see a pressure drop across the intercooler, which is our next line here. Again, I've just left this at the default values, and we can see at 7,000 RPM we've got 0.6 psi pressure drop. Uh, that would probably be for a reasonably efficient intercooler. If you're running a stock intercooler and you're pushing it pretty hard, it wouldn't be hard to get 1 psi or more pressure drop across the intercooler. Likewise, the next line down, we've got our air filter restriction. I kind of touched on that earlier something that's often overlooked and again uh, without hard data I'm just leaving this at the default values. 
Next we've got our back pressure in the exhaust system. So this is the back pressure on the outlet of the turbine housing, or sorry, the outlet of the, the turbocharger, so uh, where the exhaust uh, connects up to the turbo itself. And there's always going to be some restriction here. Again, unless you've actually measured this, you're going to be taking a bit of a guess. Uh, the values here are quite low, 2 psi at 7,000 RPM. It's actually not very hard to exceed that. So this would be quite a free-flowing exhaust system. And if you've got a restrictive factory exhaust system, uh, I've seen in excess of 10 psi. So uh, just consider that because it's something that is often overlooked. It's going to make a lot of difference to how your engine runs. Uh, next we've got our compressor efficiency and to start with what we're going to do is leave these numbers here uh, at the default values. We can come back to them and manipulate them a little bit later on once we actually know where we're operating in our compressor map and have real values. Uh, likewise we've got our turbine efficiency below that, we're going to leave that alone and our exhaust gas inlet temperature. Uh, so these want to be some relatively sensible numbers and we're running 1650 Fahrenheit which uh, I think off the top of my head is about 900 degrees C at high RPM, probably pretty realistic for uh, our uh, pump gas application at that sort of boost level. Uh, we've also got our brake specific fuel consumption and our air fuel ratio. So you will notice that at this point I actually haven't made a lot of changes here. So while yes there's a lot of data that needs to be put in and the more data we've got and the more accurate it is, clearly the better job Matchbot is going to be able to do. But even with those default values that's going to be a pretty good starting point for uh, a moderately well modified uh, hot street or maybe race engine. Okay so what we're going to do now is come down and we'll click that close. The first thing we're going to have a look at here is our matching of our operating points to our compressor map. Uh, so this is basically a situation where we can choose a range of compressor maps and see what actually suits the points that we've plotted. So we can see those red dots there, those are our six plotted points. And to start with we've got this plotted against a 6758 EFR turbocharger. Uh, now you can see that we are well within the surge line here, everything is within the surge line, however you can see that particularly our operating point 6, we're past the choke line there, uh, we're not going to be able to get a good result if we are operating on that 6758 compressor wheel. So what we can do is simply choose from our drop down menu here and we can try fitting a different compressor wheel and see how that works. Uh, so we'll try the 7064 and we can see that our operating points 5 and 6 are still right on the extreme or off the extreme of that compressor map so not what we want. Let's just jump up to the 7163. This actually looks like a, not a bad spread, we're still getting pretty close, we're going to be pushing that turbo really really hard at 18 psi uh, at 7000 rpm. Uh, but we haven't got a bad spread across that, uh, particularly the points 3, 4 and 5. Uh, we're operating sort of through uh, a, a reasonably efficient area of that map. We are still staying clear of that surge line. So this probably isn't going to be a bad option for our compressor wheel there. Alright, so now there's a little bit more information we need to consider here, which is uh, our turbine expansion ratio here, and this helps us uh, size our turbine uh, housing and turbine wheel, as well as getting a pretty good idea of what sort of boost response is realistic. So in other words, how much boost can we get at what sort of RPM. So we'll click here on our turbine map, all of these you can just click to either expand them or shrink them down. And I've already gone through and I've done this just to speed up the process a little bit. But basically, uh, again, looks pretty confusing, don't worry, it really isn't. Uh, what we've got on the right hand side here is the turbine wheel outside diameter as well as the AR of the exhaust housing. And what we want to do here is basically manipulate our turbine expansion ratio numbers here in order to make sure that all of these little red dots are located on one single line. So what I've done here, I'll try and actually just zoom this in a little bit so you can get a better idea of this. Uh, hopefully you can see that all of these dots are on that one line and if we come up through that line here, we can see that this is for our 63mm 0.5 AR exhaust housing combo. So that's the, uh, the exhaust housing that we'd be using with our 71mm compressor wheel.
So if we move back up here, I'll just shrink that back down a touch, uh, you can see that this gives us our percentage of waste gating. So in other words, how much, uh, how much of our exhaust flow is being uh, sent out through our waste gate. So we can see that we're asking for 5 PSI here at 2000 RPM and we only just barely have that waste gate cracked open. It's, uh, it's running at around about 16.4%. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll just show you what happens here. Uh, if we are asking for a boost pressure uh, that simply isn't achievable, uh, we're going to see that this says NA, it's basically saying that there's a turbine match is not possible in order to provide enough energy to the turbocharger in order to achieve our 5 psi of boost pressure. Uh, so what we need to do is adjust uh, our number up until we're we've got some positive values there, we are actually getting enough exhaust flow. So this can also be used to help with our sizing of our wastegate, we kind of know how much airflow is going to be going out through our wastegate. Alright, so with that information there, we kind of know there that the 7163 is probably going to be a reasonable match for that particular application, uh, and it's going to be probably right on the, the limit at high RPM, uh, and we know that we can get away with the point 0.84, uh, was it 0.84? Let me just have a, another look. 0.85 AR exhaust housing. Now we can have a look and sort of get some idea on what that is going to give us. So that we click on our calculated outputs. Again, there's a lot of information in here. Uh, doesn't need to be that scary. Uh, some of the key parameters that we want to look at here is we've got our calculated pressure ratio, uh, we have got our corrected airflow, in this case in pounds per minute, 51.19 pounds per minute, and uh, where we come down to some of the useful values here, we can see that this turbocharger combination should be capable of producing around about 490 horsepower flywheel, um, but there are a couple of other things we need to take into account here. Now the problem with running a small turbocharger and really pushing it hard is that at high RPM in particular we find that the uh, turbine side of the turbocharger starts becoming a restriction. It kind of starts choking down our engine. The, uh, the engine can't get rid of that exhaust gas out of it. And this becomes a problem because it reduces the volumetric efficiency of our engine. The engine simply can't breathe. It's, it's like having a really restrictive exhaust system on our car. So what we're looking at here is our exhaust manifold pressure. And I think this is probably one of the key metrics when we're looking at turbo performance and validating a turbocharger sizing. Uh, so we can see there that in particular at 7000 RPM we've got 18 PSI of boost pressure in the inlet manifold remember. In order to achieve that we're going to end up with around about 28 PSI in the exhaust manifold. So that's quite a significant increase over our boost pressure. And we see the next line down here which is listed as engine delta pressure. This gives us essentially exactly that, the difference between our exhaust manifold pressure and our inlet manifold pressure. And we can see that at 7000 RPM, our exhaust manifold pressure is 10 PSI higher than our inlet manifold pressure. Now, the upshot of this is, and this is where the system does have its limitations, um, is that when we've got our exhaust manifold pressure that much higher than our boost pressure, it's going to reduce the volumetric efficiency of the engine as I've said. Uh, so realistically what we would probably need to do is come back up here and take a bit of an estimate uh, on the uh, actual VE and maybe that's going to nose over, maybe it's not going to be 100% anymore, maybe it's going to be more like 90%. Actually, I'll also just mention for those eagle-eyed, you've probably all already picked this up. I did mention this, but then I didn't do it. Uh, once we've got a compressor match here, what we do want to do is come through and look at the actual values that we're getting in terms of our compressor efficiency. Uh, so for example here, our point 0.1, uh, we're sitting on this 0.6 or 60% efficiency line. Uh, for point 0.2 we are somewhere around about, uh, let me see, 0.68 0.66, we're around about 66% efficient. Uh, our third point there, 72% efficient. So what we want to do is basically take those numbers there and then we want to drop them into uh, our compressor efficiency here. Uh, so that's also going to affect those calculated outputs. So we want to do that before we take too much notice of our calculated outputs. 
All right, if you're still with me, we're going to go through a couple more examples. So now what we're going to do is have a look at that same engine, only this time we're going to try an 8374. So this is a next size up in the Borg Warner range. So you remember that I said the uh, the 7163, we, we're really pushing the turbo very hard. We're right at that choke point at our 7000 RPM point. So it's going to give us great bottom end response. We're going to get good boost response, but the turbocharger was probably going to fall over uh, at high RPM. Uh, so what we'll do here is we'll have a look at our compressor match this time with the 8374. Uh, so we can see that uh, this gives us a slightly better match. Uh, we are now getting pretty close to our, our surge line there at low RPM. Uh, what we can see here as well, going through that same setup, I'm not going to do all of it, but uh, going through that same setup with our turbine map, we can locate all of our uh, points, our match points on the t the turbine sizing selector, and we're going to be able to see that uh, in this instance with the 8374, we should be able to see somewhere around about 10 psi of boost by 3,000 rpm, and uh, that's got our wastegate essentially completely closed. We've only got about 1.6% uh, wastegating, so really the wastegate in that instance would be completely closed. The last application we're going to have a quick look at here is we're going to have a look at uh, the same engine, this time fitted with a larger turbo. Again, we're going to have a look at our compressor match, and we've jumped up to the 9180. So with the 9180, we've now got our points matched really well through the mid-range. We're no no longer near the uh, choke line on our compressor map, so uh, this is going to really aid our high RPM performance. I'll just come back up here. Uh, you'll note here that I have, in this application, raised our boost pressure targets. Uh, we're now targeting 24 psi of boost pressure. Uh, you'll also notice that uh, I've dropped our uh, boost pressure at low RPM. Now, our 9180 is not going to be able to spool up as well as the smaller turbocharger, uh, so that's a given. Uh, but we do notice here that uh, we do need to be careful because uh, if we drive that turbocharger much harder than we are right now at low RPM, uh, we do risk ending up running that into surge. The reality is it's not likely to be much of an issue on a 2.6 litre engine. We're not going to get the sort of exhaust gas energy in order uh, that we need in order to drive that turbocharger that that hard. All right, so what we can do there as well is uh, get some idea, and Borg want to go over this in their YouTube videos, I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Uh, we can get some idea of what the effect is going to be by swapping to a different exhaust housing AR. Uh, so let's come down to our turbine maps. So at the moment, uh, again, I'll just try and, and open this up a little bit. Uh, so we are looking at the uh, 9180 using the one point. 0.05 AR exhaust housing. So this is the line that we've got all of our points nicely matched on. Uh, they also do a 9180 with a 1.45 AR exhaust housing. So uh, what we can do is basically see what the effect of changing between the 1.05 and the 1.45 would be. So to do that, uh, we've got all our points plotted at the moment. I'll just shrink this back down and we'll see. I'm not going to do every point because we'll be here for an eternity. Uh, before we do this, let's have a look at our calculated outputs again and the key calculated output that we want to look at here is our exhaust well, engine delta pressure or in other words we know we're talking here about our exhaust back pressure we can see we've got 28 psi of exhaust back pressure 24 psi of boost pressure so our delta is minus 4 psi that's actually pretty good that's a that's a pretty good number we're not offering a lot of restriction and that's going to help our engine make a lot of power however let's see what happens when we change that so let's look just at that point 6 and what I'm going to do is just move that up to uh, our 1.45 line, got that sort of pretty much nicely there. Uh, if you're watching there, as we move that up, we see that our required waste gating reduces. This is simply because we don't need to bypass as much exhaust gas around the turbocharger. Now if we look at our calculated outputs, uh, we can see that our exhaust back pressure has dropped from 28 psi, I think it was, down to 26.4 psi. Our delta pressure across the engine has dropped from minus 4 psi to minus 2. So we are reducing that back pressure. This is allowing the engine to 
breathe more freely. So this in turn, you'll remember I said, improves the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So we can get an idea of how that's going to affect the engine performance. At the same time, while we are doing all of that, uh, we're also able to see, obviously wasn't changing our low RPM uh, 3000 set point, uh, but we're going to be able to get an idea of uh, what sort of boost pressure is going to be likely at those lower RPM ranges. Alright, so obviously it is a complex tool there, I've given you a lightning quick uh, tour of that tool, uh, but as I've said, if you do want to learn more, please uh, check out those tutorials on the BorgWarner YouTube site, uh, we'll make it really easy to understand how to use that, and it's a good way of just playing around for a few hours and getting a feel for uh, what each of the different turbochargers in that range are likely to perform like on your given engine, and most importantly by doing that, you're going to make sure that the compressor map that you're going to be operating uh, nicely in, in, a, in a good range inside of that compressor map. Uh, hopefully you might even have a little bit of headroom for if you want to lean on that combination a little bit harder in the future and it's also going to help you with sizing uh, your turbine wheel. Alright, uh, I will jump into questions really shortly so this is a good time to just mention and it looks like we've got a hell of a lot there already. See if we can get through all these, might be here for the rest of the day. Uh, so if you do have any more questions, maybe maybe not too many more, um, please ask those in uh, the comments and we'll get into those in a second. Um, I did, I was actually going to do this and I completely forgot, so this is a good time to, to do so. Uh, what is also, I've actually changed that, uh, what is also worth mentioning is if you are looking at the difference between a single scroll and a split pulse exhaust housing, you can kind of get an idea of how that's going to work. Again, this is described in a bit more detail in the Borg Warner videos, uh, but what that will do is it's going to affect the turbine efficiency uh, and what you can do there is basically uh, take a bit of an educated guess at an increase in these turbine efficiencies. So again, on Borg Warner's recommendations, have recommended increasing the turbine efficiency uh, at uh, low RPM from maybe 75 up by about 15%, so we take that up to 90. Uh, maybe we'll go another 10% at 4,000 RPM, so we'll take that up to, oh, I've actually already done that as well, 83, and then uh, maybe we'll go to 80% uh, at 0.3. So when we do that, we can see how that's going to affect the ability of the turbocharger to produce boost pressure. Uh, and we can then manipulate what exhaust housing we're operating in and see what that's going to result in in both our boost response as well as our turbine inlet pressure. So uh, it's quite a powerful way of really getting a, a solid idea of how that turbo is going to perform before we actually ever hand over any money and go to the trouble of fitting the turbocharger. All right, the last topic I'm going to go through here is uh, validating the performance of the turbocharger because as we've seen here on Matchbot, uh, we are making a lot of assumptions there and we don't have all of those pieces of data necessarily. And if you are going to get serious about making sure you're getting the most out of your turbo, it is worth considering uh, adding some sensors so you can actually data log and validate the performance. Uh, if you do end up updating your turbocharger at a later point, you're then going to have a lot of solid data to work from rather than sort of uh, just a gut feel so to speak. Uh, so in particular the uh, pieces of equipment or sensors that I would suggest adding in would be starting with an exhaust manifold back pressure sensor or turbine inlet pressure. Now this allows you to look at the ratio between turbine inlet pressure and inlet manifold pressure and for me I kind of use this as a, as a rough line in the sand for uh, sizing the turbocharger. Basically uh, the lower that ratio is the more performance we're going to get out of our turbocharger, uh, the freer flowing our engine is. So basically the lower our exhaust manifold back pressure is, the more free flowing our engine is going to be, the higher the volumetric efficiency, the more power we can make. Uh, so a really good example of this is in our drag racing engines, uh, we were aiming for a pressure ratio below 1.0, so in other words we wanted our turbine inlet pressure to be lower than our boost pressure. Once we got to that point, this is sort of almost where our turbocharged engine starts acting like a naturally aspirated engine and we can start adding more aggressive cams with more overlap without the downsides we see with a more restrictive turbocharger. So 
The problem with a very low pressure ratio like this is uh, it doesn't provide a lot of exhaust gas energy to drive the turbocharger so in turn we see a higher boost threshold. So it wasn't uncommon for example with my own 2 litre drag engine uh, I wasn't seeing full boost until 7000 RPM. That was okay for me because I was launching at 7800 RPM and we were running it out to 10500 RPM with a sequential dog box and flat shifting. Uh, the turbocharger never had an opportunity to drop out of its, its useful power band. Uh, with a more uh, responsive setup we're probably going to be looking somewhere in the region of a pressure ratio of 1.0 to 1.5 times uh, boost pressure so uh, that's where uh, if we were running 10 psi of boost pressure in our inlet manifold we'd probably be expecting to see maybe somewhere in the region of 10, 12 to 15 psi of exhaust manifold back pressure. That's not a bad place to be, we're still going to get great response from our engine and we're still going to make great power. Uh, if we look at what's happening in a factory turbocharged engine where uh, the manufacturers are really focusing on low end response uh, at the sacrifice of high RPM performance, it's not uncommon to see the exhaust manifold pressure uh, somewhere in the region of as much as two or more times boost pressure so if we had 10 psi of inlet manifold pressure we might see 20 plus psi in the exhaust so this is problematic because it really hinders our high rpm performance and this is why if you look at the boost curve in a, a lot of factory turbocharged cars uh, almost inevitably you see a peak in boost at low rpm uh, around peak torque and then the boost will tend to taper away as that exhaust manifold back pressure uh, gains uh, the other thing that's really useful, if you want to start plotting your points or operating points more accurately on one of those compressor maps just to validate how the turbo is performing, uh, it's nice if you've got a compressor or turbo speed sensor. Uh, generally these were incredibly frustrating and difficult and expensive to fit. These days most of the uh, performance turbo manufacturers are making our life really easy. Uh, with Borg Warner as well as Garrett with their new G-series turbochargers, uh, there are uh, ports already already on the turbocharger uh, for mounting these kits. So it's as simple as taking the compressor, housing off, uh, drilling through the end of that hole and fitting a kit that you can buy from the supplier. So that makes it really easy and then you can know exactly what your compressor speed is, turbo speed is. Particularly for some of these turbos, Borg Warner turbos are reliable as hell as long as you stay under their maximum critical speed. So you do want to know if you're getting close to that critical speed in an application where you really pushing that turbocharger hard. Uh, of course then we can get a little bit more sophisticated as well and start measuring things like the pressure drops across our uh, inlet system, across our intercooler, so we've got all of that data. Sometimes that can actually shock you into modifying these components and getting a nice improvement in performance that you didn't even know you were losing. And uh, lastly our air temp, you can actually measure uh, what the air temp is coming out of the turbocharger, you can measure the air temp out of your intercooler, start getting some data on the efficiency of how well your intercooler is doing its job. Alright guys, it's been a really long webinar but it uh, looks like we've got a bunch of questions so we're not done yet. Let's get stuck into these and I'll see how many of these I can get through. Hopefully I can answer them all. Uh, Ben has asked, probably a little bit off our turbo topic, this is from our pre-show regarding the Toyota 86 uh, and overheating. Um, yeah, just talking about the undertrain, the body panels. Yeah, we've uh, we've honestly tried a, a, a lot. We've been dealing with uh, Toyota 86's overheating for about sort of five years now. And um, I can assure you we've done just about everything uh, that you could sensibly think about. But um, if you're following our social media channels, we're going to be covering what we do and how well it works. So you'll get an idea of what the fix, hopefully, that we find is. Uh, Craig has asked, so I've had my head ported and have the flow bench results. How do I use those in the calculator? Okay, so it's uh, it's not really just a case of flow bench numbers on your cylinder head. Uh, really what we need to know is volumetric efficiency numbers of the engine and that goes a little bit further than just flow numbers of the head. Uh, this takes into account the whole operation of the engine. And flow numbers, uh, while I am not a head porter, flow numbers are useful but they do not tell you the entire story about how a given cylinder head is going to perform. Uh, the reason for this is that airflow and air velocity are both very very important 
Uh, so a mistake that a lot of beginning uh, headporters make is thinking the old story of bigger is obviously better. Uh, so they'll hock out the ports to a massive size. They see a massive improvement in outright airflow numbers, but what this does, particularly at low RPM, is it just destroys air speed. And uh, when you actually put that, that cylinder head back on the engine and dyno it, uh, what you find is that you may have increased the performance at high RPM, uh, but you've now got an absolute dog uh, through the low RPM and mid range. So uh, unfortunately, cylinder head flow numbers on their own are, are not enough to really help you with these calculators. Uh, Adam has asked, can a turbocharger improve fuel efficiency? Okay, a complex one there. Uh, I, I would say basically the simple answer is yes it can uh, and this is why we are seeing a drive now with OE manufacturers. They are downsizing engines and adding turbochargers and uh, that combination with a small capacity engine uh, and boosted, you're seeing an improvement in the fuel efficiency. Uh, for our particular performance instances though, that's probably not particularly relevant uh, and generally when we, add, we are adding forced induction to an engine, our brake specific fuel consumption is going to increase compared to a naturally aspirated engine, uh, but we are of course going to be making a lot more power. So uh, I don't know if that really specifically answers your question, but it is a bit of a tricky one to answer. Uh, Polzin has asked, is the power measured at the flywheel or rear wheel horsepower, for example, the turbo rated at 1200 horsepower, is that at the flywheel or the rear wheels? Okay, uh, so the ratings for turbochargers are always an engine power or flywheel power number, and you do need to be really careful about trying to relate them to wheel power numbers. Uh, the reason for this is simply if you put your car on five different dynos, you're likely to get five different numbers, and sometimes these numbers can be vastly different, so uh, yeah. It's, it's always talking about flywheel values there. Uh, Barry has asked, uh, maybe this is for a webinar all to itself, but can you explain corrected turbine gas flow charts and how they correlate to turbine housing AR? Uh, probably not something that needs to be dealt with in, uh, in a separate webinar, but uh, yeah, Garrett produced turbine flow charts with corrected uh, mass flow, and uh, this is basically corrected for the turbine temperature, the gas temperature. Uh, so if you have your, your turbine inlet temperature, uh, you can actually go through the process of calculating that mass flow number out. Uh, maybe uh, you could ask the, the, a question about that in the forum and I can try and deal with that in a little bit more detail. Uh, JP's asked, single scroll versus twin scroll versus V-band type rear housings, pros and cons. Uh, dealt with that already in the webinar, single scroll versus twin scroll. The twin scroll well designed should provide uh, an improvement in low RPM boost response. Alternatively, you can step up to a larger AR housing uh, without sacrificing boost response. You're going to make more power. Uh, the V-band type housing, the advantage with these is just in simplicity of working on the turbocharger and on the engine. Uh, these days there are, the, there are the availability of both split pulse and single entry V-band housings as well, so you don't necessarily in all applications uh, need to be using a T4 style 4 bolt flange. Uh, with our race or competition vehicles, we're going to be working on those engines a lot more frequently. Parts come off, parts get put on, so uh, for me the V-band housing is, is almost most a must have. I really like uh, that style of exhaust housing. Really quick and easy to work on. Uh Tony has asked, uh, can we get an opinion on the EFR versus the G-Series and which may be better? Um, unfortunately, no, you can't because at this point I have not had the op opportunity to test out any of the G-Series turbochargers. Uh, what I'd say is that up until probably the last few years, I, I think Borg Warner with their EFR range had, had really shown uh, an improvement and a performance advantage over Garrett. Maybe not a, a massive significant advantage, but a an advantage nonetheless. Uh, Garrett with the G-Series, I think this was their, basically their uh, sort of throwdown to, to Borg Warner, and these turbochargers are aimed to be operating on a competitive footing with the EFR turbos. The evidence I've seen from dyno sheets does look really compelling. These G-Series turbochargers look like they're doing a great job, uh, but you yeah, haven't actually used one myself. Uh, we are going to 
be running a G series on our SR20 VE engines, so we want to be doing exactly that. And uh, we're working with Garrett on that. We are running at the moment a Garrett GTX 3076R Gen 2 in its own right, definitely no slouch of a turbo, and a pretty good match to an SR20 VE motor for our power aims. Uh, what we're going to do is get some hard data on that. It's going to be instrumented with all of the sensors that I talked about in the webinar. Uh, then we will be swapping to a turbo that they've got coming out very shortly, their new G30 series turbo. And this will give us a really good opportunity to do a direct back-to-back. -back. And it's not often you get the opportunity to test just a single change such as that with a turbo. So we're really excited about getting that information. Um, Ken has asked if uh, oh, if uh, versus G series pretty much same question there. I'm curious about the twin scroll setups on smaller capacity engines, uh, like a 1.6 liter 4 AGE. Does the twin scroll only become advantageous when we come into the bigger turbo sizes, such as the GT30 size frame? Uh, no, the 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 theory of operation and the the advantages are going to be there regardless whether you're talking about a 1.6 litre engine or maybe a 3 litre 6 cylinder engine. Uh, the only real uh, hassle factor there is your exhaust manifold design does need to accommodate the split pulse housing and the firing order of your engine. Uh, Terry has asked, when a person says they have a 90 millimeter turbo, is that measurement at the inducer or the exducer of the compressor wheel? Uh, so when we're talking about that, the, the measurement that's most often used there is going to be the exducer diameter. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more turbochargers rated on their, their compressor diameter and we'll see the, the likes of Borg Warner there with their EFR. Uh, they basically give us the OD of the uh, compressor and the exhaust wheels in the, the name of the turbo, let's say 9180, uh, that's what we've got there. Uh, CMAX has asked, uh, thoughts on the HX35 turbos from Holset, uh, to be more accurate, the HX35 with a 9cm hot side. Okay, the HX35s, it's a turbo that unfortunately I haven't had the opportunity to ever use. Uh, they do apparently, they do appear they have to be um, an incredibly popular turbocharger and the results I've seen from them seem to be pretty great. Uh, they are also quite a cost effective option. I mean today we've talked a little bit about the uh, Borg Warner and we've talked about the uh, Garrett turbochargers and while yes both great turbochargers both use ball bearing technology uh, and they are quite an expensive unit so uh, that does need to be factored in as well. Uh, Jimmy Neutron has asked, where can I find a turbine inlet pressure sensor for data logging? Okay, so the pressure sensor we use is actually nothing special there. Uh, generally, we're just going to be using a 0 to 150 PSI gauge pressure sensor. Uh, the tricky part is how we plumb that up to the exhaust manifold or turbine housing so that it's not damaged. Obviously, we've got uh, exhaust gas there that could be uh, around the 900 to 1000 degree C mark, and the sensor is not going to last very long if we just screw it into our exhaust manifold. Uh, so with this what we want to do is remotely locate the sensor uh, and the general, general way of doing this is to use copper tube and we're going to bend our copper tube up, tube up into uh, a bunch of little circles and that's going to then run out to our sensor and the length of copper tube is going to basically take all of the heat out of that exhaust gas before it reaches the sensor. It's also a really good idea to make sure that the sensor is mounted above the point in the manifold that you've taken that uh, EG t the exhaust pressure source from so that we don't end up with moisture tracking down into the sensor. Uh, See, Marion has asked, uh, do external wastegates have an advantage over internal wastegates, particularly on the EFR range of turbos? Uh, yeah, the, the, there can be advantages. So really the main one is probably, I'll, I'll step away from the EFR range for a start. Traditionally what we've found is that as we step into larger size turbochargers, uh, the external wastegate just becomes uh, a requirement. It's not really whether there's an advantage or a disadvantage, we just simply don't have any capacity for an internal wastegate on the exhaust housing. Uh, so this has changed obviously a little bit. Uh, Borg Warner with their EFR range uh, made a big play to including internal wastegates on 
on their turbochargers. Uh, but the important thing to understand is that these turbine housings were designed from the outset for the internal wastegate actuation. Uh, so they've got nice flow paths into the wastegate as well as wastegates that are properly sized. So uh, the the EFR range is a little bit difficult to compare that to a conventional turbocharger. There are still some hassle factors, I guess I'll, I'll say, with using an internal wastegate on the likes of an EFR turbo, uh, and that is because we still have to mount the actual actuator somewhere, uh, and generally we're going to always be needing to clock the turbo housings relative to each other in order to get everything located exactly where we need it for our particular installation, uh, and sometimes that can be limiting with whereabouts that wastegate actuator can go. Really good example of this is on our turbocharged Toyota 86. We run a Borg Warner EFR 6758 with a T25 exhaust house, a flanged exhaust housing and the internal wastegate. It works really, really well, but the problem is the angle that the wastegate actuator comes off, uh, the place that the wastegate actuator really should be uh, would be essentially scraping along the ground. So we've had to make some compromises there uh, to mount the wastegate actuator in a way where it's still going to operate correctly uh, but it's not going to end up interfering with the ground or anything under the car. Uh, in very high horsepower applications I have heard of some people still running into problems with boost control uh, with the internal wastegate EFR turbos. This is third hand information so take it with a grade of Salt, I personally have not seen this firsthand. Um, our next question is I think everyone would like to know if you choose a turbo by size, uh, turbo size by the amount of cylinders and displacement, I assume. Uh, okay, so well, hopefully this webinar has cleared up that there's a lot more to it than that. That's a, a pretty simplistic view and I understand why you asked that question because if we go to any of the turbo manufacturers websites, uh, there's always going to be a power range and a capacity range that that turbocharger is suited to. Uh, you could think of this as a really coarse way of sizing a turbocharger for your engine, but there's a lot more that we need to consider before we fine tune that, that selection and actually uh, get down to the exact turbo we're going to fit. Um, Ash has asked, uh, there are coalition, there, there's a coalition between the inlet and the exhaust housing is there a coalition between, a correlation I think you're going with there, between the inlet and exhaust housings and wheel sizes? I've heard of people putting bigger intake wheels and housings on a turbo, but retaining the rear housing and housing AR. Okay, so yeah, there, there is. Um, these, what you're talking about there is, is something that was very, very common probably at the start of my career where we didn't have access to the range of uh, specialist performance turbos we do now. Uh, so quite a common option was to take a factory turbocharger, uh, maybe fit a larger compressor wheel. Now the reason we would do that, why we'd fit a larger compressor wheel, as we've already discussed, to make a certain amount of power, we need to be able to flow a certain amount of air and there's a limit on how much air a given compressor can flow. So by going to a larger compressor that can increase the airflow potential for that, that wheel. So that fixes one side of the turbocharger. The problem however is that the turbine and the compressor wheel do need to be properly matched. Uh, if they aren't, and this is an issue that I have seen uh, several times in my career where a compressor wheel is mismatched to the turbine, we can end up finding that we drive that turbocharger into surge. Uh, so a way that that was dealt with with a lot of these hybrid turbos is we fit a larger compressor wheel, uh, we then perform a back cut to the turbine wheel. It's pretty primitive really these days but uh, as its name implies it's essentially uh, the, a, a portion of the turbine wheel is ground away which uh, improves airflow through it. Uh, it makes the turbo, basically we don't provide as much energy to the turbocharger. This helps us get away from that surge problem uh, and that is kind of one option for a hybrid turbo. Turbo. These days we are uh, uh, lucky to have the access to a lot of these performance turbochargers where uh, we have got well matched combinations between compressor and turbine wheels. Uh, guys, we are going to have to call it there. I've still got a bunch of questions here and I am going to apologise right now to those guys whose questions I haven't been able to get to uh, but we have simply run out of time there. Uh, for all of our HPA members, if you do have other questions that crop up after this webinar has aired, please feel free to ask those in the forum and I'll be happy to answer them there. Alright guys, thanks a lot for joining us and I will see you all next week.
Now for those who are watching on Facebook today, it looks like there is a bunch of you, some really great questions that have come out of Facebook. Uh, this is just a little insight into what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. Now if you are interested in learning more and maybe becoming a Gold member, uh, then you can purchase Gold membership which will give you access to these webinars as well as our archive of existing webinars. There's almost 200 hours of content in our webinar archive. Uh, you're also going to get access to our private members only online forum. Uh, you can purchase that membership for 19 US dollars a month but you'll also get three months of free access with the purchase of any of our courses. Alright guys thanks again and I hope to see you online again next week. Cheers guys. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. Click the link in the description to learn more.